we may have started, but I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Spokane City Council Urban Experience Meeting. Is we now Candace, are you? Yeah, we are underway. Do you? Did so, you say anything? Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, it needed to be broadcast because it's a public meeting. So we're now officially uh, broadcasting and able to begin the urban experience meeting, even though I think there's been some discussion started already. And I turn it back to you, Chairwoman Stratton. Okay, thank you. Should I just go forward? Yeah. Okay. So, um, that that land was given to the library in the 60s exclusively for those purposes um so part of this is really it, it's a cleanup of uh, of what uh, those documents say texture. and fully uh, granting that piece of property to spokane public library uh, you may recall a couple of years ago uh, probably close to 10 there's always been this oh, what if there's not a library there what if the city were to I don't know, change it to an H&M, um, uh, which was an actual discussion about a decade ago uh, for that piece of property. So this really, uh, it, it does two things. It would give city control of the Hilliard Library building. This is a piece of property where, again, city owns the land, library owns the building. It's like having, you know, each of us having a piece of, of uh, monopoly property and, and, and no one can build a house on it. Um, so this fixes up that uh, detail within the, the property ownership and, and really sets up the library in the future. Uh, you know, that, that piece of property, us having con the library having control of that property exclusively. Um, looks like my screen went a little weird here. We still see you. Okay, good. Um, Excuse me, I'm so sorry. That, that sets up and the library really well in the future and gives the community uh, an option uh, for the Hilliard Library. It's very similar to Same. what we're doing with the East Side Branch and the Sprague property, uh, where there was an exchange okay. uh, between those two. Andrew, yeah. hold on just one second. <laughs> Candace, mom. We've got, do we have pro uh, technical problems? No, uh, but what we do need to do is make sure that we have complete disclosure. So I'm sorry to interrupt. This is important information. Andrew, could you just summarize your setup for this? Because the public wasn't able to join until you, you had already started. So if you could do that, then we'll be in compliance sure. legally. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So the background behind this is uh, Spokane Public Library will be vacating the Hilliard Library uh, as soon as we are ready to move in onto the Shaw campus. There is community interest in what will happen with the, Spokane, the Hilliard Library once we do vacate, vacate it. Um, we don't want to have an empty building uh, on that campus uh, when it could be used for greater purposes uh, for the community. So our Board of Trustees met uh, and looked about around at strategies uh, of how to either exchange, offload uh, this property for that greater community use. Uh, and what we are proposing is a exchange of the Hilliard Library building to the city of Spokane in exchange for the property the Central Library sits on, which in the deed for that property, it can only be used for library purposes um, as granted by the Comstock Foundation. Um, at the July uh, Board of Trustees meeting, uh, the full board met and granted uh, me authority to enter into an agreement uh, with the city uh, uh, that would allow this to take place. Does that sound like I covered it? It looks like you did because council member Cathcart has a question. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, and I think the, uh, the plan um, is to look at that, that Hilliard library site as a location for a behavioral health um, uh, lo location that would be partnered with multi-care. And so there's a really good opportunity for, for that to, to, to really serve the community if we can make this transfer happen. Correct. Uh, the the uh, board of the Northeast Community Center did reach out uh, to the library on this matter. 
Um, our board doesn't feel that it's necessarily the library's position to decide what goes into that building. Um, so it's sort of two separate issues uh, that we're looking at here, but very much connected. So. Does anybody else have questions, concerns, comments? Councilmember Wilkerson. So what type of timeline are we looking for this to happen in, Andrew? Right, so uh, from the library's perspective, um, there's no rush on the timeline. However, uh, uh, and council member Cathcart would probably agree uh, that there is some urgency if the, if the city were to decide to uh, work with the community center, uh, there is uh, CARES dollars or recovery dollars that uh, they are interested in using along with a generous donation from uh, MultiCare to rehab the uh, facility to you know, be utilized. But again, um, those are two separate issues, uh, at least in my mind. So, Andrew, who would be the person at the city who we could get more information from? Or, like, my concern would be how do we reach out to that community um, to get some input on what they'd like to see so nobody is um, not informed? Is there a contact here at the city that we should be chatting with? You know, I, I, I don't know that okay. answer. I know the zone has done extensive uh, community outreach. Um, I see Ms. Uh, Council Member Cathcart raising okay. as well. Yeah, uh, Council Stratton, there, there's been uh, several meetings led by uh, the zone um, and numerous community partners to, to look at the entire complex and try to identify uses and, and multi-care has been in that conversation. I think Andrew was, was early on in those discussions. And so th there's been quite a few of those um, that have taken place and some really big ideas to try and stand up, hopefully in time for the school year starting, which is a little bit of, of the uh, yeah. time crunch, so. Right, so this isn't gonna be a big surprise to the, to the neighbors in the, in the area. They all know that this is going on, right? That's, that's my sense, yeah, there's been a lot of outreach. Perfect, that's the only thing I worry about. So you answered my question, thank you. Okay, does anybody else have any questions on this one? All right, Andrew, I think you're free to go enjoy your Monday. Thank you all, good to see you. Thank you, good to see you too. All right, I'm gonna go back to Bonnie. Bonnie, did you, are you with us? So I'm looking for Washington State Department of Transportation presentation. And I've got Charlene Hi. and Bonnie and Greg. Hi. 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 Good morning. Oh, good morning. How are you? I'm good. Sorry, I had some technical problems this morning. I have to use a back on this computer, evidently. So it's working now. Okay. So I'm anyway, so thank it you over. for being I'm patient it over with to you. Those. And uh, I'm also having bandwidth problems. Um, okay. I'm still working from my shop. So I don't know if you can all hear me very so well. We can hear you. And we've got you down for, let's see, about 20 minutes. So if you're ready, we're gonna, we're gonna let you take it over and talk to us. Okay, I turned off my camera. Can everyone hear me? We can, we can hear you perfectly. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Okay. So I'm going to great. hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, um, Urban Experience Committee members. Thanks for being patient with us this morning. Um, I know this telework environment sometimes isn't very fun. But I have to ask one question before I start. I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, so could you tell me how much time we have to present? We have reserved 20 minutes. Awesome. Okay. All right. So here we go. Okay. So um, for those of you, okay, so I wanted to thank you for inviting WashDOT to share with you about the West Plains February Transportation Management Plan, Phase 1. It's a U.S. to vicinity west of town, out to Railway Heights, 
For those of you that don't know me, which I'm thinking is most of you, my name is Bonnie Gao. I'm the senior planner for WASHDOT Eastern Region Planning, so I work with Charlene Kay and Greg Sig. I have been leading this study. Um, the study focuses primarily, wait, I need to share my screen. Hold on a second. <laughs> you guys need to see something. Okay. Hannah Lee, if you're out there, can you possibly help Bonnie share her screen? There we go. Can you see it now? We don't see it. Okay. Let me know when you see it. I try sharing it again. So far, nothing. There you go. Okay, we see it. Oh, you we see, see it? it? Perfect. Oh, good. Oh, yay. Okay, all right. So, do you see the beginning screen? Yes. It says West Plains Subbury Transportation Management Plan? Yes. Awesome. It's the first, okay. Yeah, the first, the first slide up. We see it. Oh, it just okay. went away. It did? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Bonnie, I can share it if you need to. And okay, will you share it? Awesome. That'd be great, sure. I'm having issues over here. Okay, we see it. Perfect. Okay. There it is. It's uh, West Plains Sub Area Transportation Management Plan, yeah. Phase One. Awesome. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the West Plains area is defined. Okay, so. I lost my place there. Okay, the study focuses primary, primarily around US 2, but looks at the land use in and around the West Plains area. So it's defined by the white lines around in the map, the boundaries. We have been working in this study for about two years, but not continuously because of funding and staffing limitations. So, oh, sorry, do you want to put the next slide? Okay. Thank you. So these are all of our partners, not all of them, but the made the the major partners, we have a few more partners that we've also worked through collaboratively through these efforts. We are fortunate enough to have a lot of partners on this project. There are other, you know, there's different jurisdictions all along. So it starts out, you know, city of Spokane, Spokane County, <coughs> Washtenaw, um, and the city of Erie Heights as far as along the corridor, and then the other partners. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So many of you are probably asking why this study. You're probably aware that this is one of the fastest growing areas within Spokane County. This was actually confirmed a few years back. There was a joint um, study done by the University of Washington in collaboration with FRTC and WASHDOT back in 2013. Um, this is a, one of the fastest growing areas, both in Spokane County and Washington State. It was based okay. on availability of land, There's utilities, and infrastructure. Eat. This There's would be an area where they would see a lot of land use development. And as a result of the rapid land use development and the fact that we have not been able to develop a supporting multimodal transportation network to keep up with the growing land use demand, there is a need for us to study and identify what is the best multimodal, multimodal framework that would support the rapid land use in this area. The study focuses primarily on mobility and safety needs in and around the US 2 corridor. Next slide, please, Char. So since the beginning, um, Fairchild has been one of our focus areas. That it's Fairchild Air Force Base is located within the study area, and the trip serving the facility is one of the primary uses of US-2 and I-90 in and around this area. So maintaining a one-hour one travel time distance for staff and personnel is needed in order to live and work between Fairchild and wherever they're living. So it's based on a one-hour travel time distance. So in this map, it shows you right now 
as far as travel time, you know, using the roads within that area how fast that they could get to the base. And as mobility decreases and diminishes along this corridor, the radius in the areas in which they live will continue to shrink. So we'll have to move in closer if the mobility gets worse. Next slide, please. So based on an assessment of where people work and live, origins and destinations from the U.S. Census Bureau, you know where the, uh, guest we found is. that 95% of these people that work in the study area, they actually live outside uh. the study area. There's not enough housing. So people are commuting into the area daily. So that's adding a lot to the congestion within the area. Next, next slide, please. So WashDOT has continually participated, you know, in different studies supporting them. Um, one of them is the Irving Heights signing efforts in and around the core downtown area. As part of the as part of the planning process, we committed that we would evaluate opportunities to accommodate proposed corridor changes along US two after analyzing and preparing a more comprehensive plan around how US two will actually function and operate. As a result of our current planning efforts, we will be able to incorporate the City of Airway Heights proposed revitalization area in the downtown corridor, which will include medium treatment, provisions for bicycle and pedestrians. All of those measures will be rolled into this current plan as part of the analysis merging strategies. Next slide. Okay, so these were focus areas from the very beginning. We have a technical advisory team that has been working with us and they're made up of our partners. But these were our focus areas from the very beginning of our study efforts. So as you can see, it was safety, mobility, quality of life, and economic vitality. Next slide. So these are, um, the majority of all of the studies that have been done along this corridor. So as presented here, this area has been studied by more different entities. And the goal of this current study is to align the studies, all of the studies, and provide current strategies in order to address the issues with mobility and safety in a manner that that's practical. So we're using practical solution. And it looks at managing the system prior to providing any capacity improvements. And therefore, transportation systems and operations, what we call TISMO strategies, along with practical solutions, were the primary strategies that were used to address the issues along the corridor. Next slide, please. And now, this is I'm going to turn it over to Greg. He is our um, development manager. Go ahead, Greg, if you can hear me. I can. Can you can folks hear me as well? We can hear you, Greg, and welcome. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you for having us. Um, so the land use method the land use methodology we used was um, was it was a different approach than than was typical. We actually hired the Leland Consulting Group that. Um, to take a look at what the land use on the West Plains might be, because as you know, there's a significant amount of vacant land. There is a, a variety of zoning types out there from residential to industrial. And realizing that you know, probably every parcel would not have a, um, a building on it, and what, what would be possible or probable, uh, probable is a better word, for the Spokane area. Um, given a lot of things. So a few things that with the slide, I won't read it all, but it'll, they looked at demographics, they looked at employment, um, of course, development trends, uh, what is the local demand, and even um, stakeholder interviews. When we, when we talk about interviews, they interviewed the, some of the larger developers, the realtors, um, the governmental agencies. So they, they took kind of a wide net at looking at, at interviews, building permit data, um, income data, you know, uh, trends in the country, trends in the county, and and then you know zeroed in on the West Plains. What what you know what would be a likely scenario? So it was basically a scenario they came up with. Okay, so um, 
what they found is there is, you know, opportunities, residential growth. We all know that there's a, a, a drastic housing shortage. Um, Fair Child Air Force and their mission continues to grow at, at um, you know, more employees, both civilian and military. Um, industrial growth, we, we all know Amazon came and all the surrounding businesses that maybe not as large, but still are significant to the West, the West Plains. Uh, uh, SIA work, working with the tra to develop a transload facility to take advantage of the of the rail corridor extension. Opportunity zone would refer to the uh, Spokane tribe where they uh, have a, a promise zone, which is a federal designation, which you know, may help with some funding for uh, for businesses. Uh, other things, I ninety corridor. Uh, we have an airport, the international airport there. We also have a new transit center to bringing in much better uh, bus service. And we have a lot of investment in, in infrastructure with the DOT, the county and the city. So a lot of, a lot of things are, a lot of things are help, you know, are, are happening out there. So um, tribal lands, certainly there's a lot of tribal lands that can be built out. A lot of industrial lands by Highway 2 and I-90. Um, residential lands again by Highway 2 and I-90. Uh, development on the airport is is something that is you know it's been ongoing. Um, and uh, you know Spokane uh, just has had an unprecedented rate of growth, a hot market, and uh, a lot of growth. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is probably one of the more more important slides is it's a this is a summary of what Leland found um, on the West Plains. They believe in the next 20 years that there's the, the opportunity for 16,000 new um, housing units. Of course, that's both multifamily and single family that could occur. A lot of demand to, with the, the strong uh, uh, growth of jobs out there. Office 270,000 square feet of office. Um, and but the another real significant number is industrial development. Six million square feet of projected industrial, and that's on top of these one of projects like Amazon. They're, they say those are just hard to figure because they're kind of one of. But but um, outside of those giant big boxes, they're projecting um, you know, that six six million square feet of industrial and 2.3 of uh, million square feet of retail to serve the housing and industrial and commercial uses. So next slide, please. Um, this is a, a map showing where they, you know, where they suspect that, that development will be, will be centered or, you know, centered around those five, you know, around I-90 transit corridor, Highway 2 being a transit corridor. Um, and of course the, in the residential where where the residential zoning exists, or and like in Spokane County, it's also allowed in the commercial zone. So they, Leland saw some of the commercial zone actually giving way to support um, multifamily development. And of course, the the two tribal properties have um, you know the ability to have both commercial, industrial, and residential lands. Um, next slide. I think this is back to back to Bonnie. Yes, back to me. Thank you, Greg. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, collaboratively through every step of the process, we have vetted everything through the technical advisory team, which is made up of our partners. So, we've had a lot of study accomplishments. And I'm not going to read all of these off, but we began with the purpose and needs, went into the methods and assumptions, um, we went to origin and destination. We've done different assessments for uh, like for environmental. Um, we had ex we've had extensive community engagement. So we went out into um, just we went out into the medical or medical lake West Plains area and we attended events such as the Medical Lake Frontier Days. Um, we had a listening post like at Yokes and Fairchild. Um, we attended Northern Quest. We had a few meetings out there, um, like with the PUD, um, the Chamber of Commerce, excuse me. So there's been quite a few things that we've done. We 
um, developed a two-part survey. Um, one portion was developed specifically by the City of Area Heights to get a perception of what the public thought about the area. And we had a public survey that went along with that, asking additional questions. There was over 600 responses, which we, we thought were, was phenomenal, uh, especially for a study. Um, and then we developed the traffic circulation plan with the technical advisory team, which I will show you in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So also, there, we ha we've had a lot of firsts with this study as well. So we've had a lot of pilot efforts working with headquarters. We also, this is the first living study that we have in our region, I think actually statewide. Um, but if you go to connectwestplains.com, it's going to be a living study. It's going to be updated um, in future years, um, even after, um, you know, after this presentation, it will be updated continually in the future. Um, we performed a safety assessment working with headquarters. That was a pilot project. It was a little different. We had a planning level traffic analysis just for, um, and what, which we are still working on a portion of that. We have travel time along the portal, which I'll show you in a few minutes. We held a practical solutions lab, which was a two day event, and we had subject matter experts come in. Um, there was about over 40 people that attended that event. And from all of our work with the technical advisory team and the practical solutions lab, we have a strategy list which was sent to you and that's what we're asking for concurrence yeah, on. <clears throat> Did you see that Next Tanya slide. has a 45 minute discussion today? So as part of the study effort in collaboration with our partners, we identified the best way to manage vehicular circulation in and around this corridor working with the technical advisory team. And what we identified was roundabouts because roundabouts were found to provide the greatest mobility and access while reducing severe and fatal crashes along the corridor. Studies have also found that roundabouts provided a 30% increase in travel time compared to signalized intersections. So this further supports our use of roundabouts on this corridor. So this is the plan and you can't see it very well and I apologize. Chuck, could you back up one slide please? Okay, so I just wanted to show you. So this is the US2 corridor. And then to the north, you can barely see there's 610 wells that runs along par paralleling the route. And then also there's 18th and 21st to the south. And we will send you a copy of this presentation after, after today. The okay, next slide, Char. So I just wanted to zoom in and just show you. So basically, on all the main intersections, we either have signals or roundabouts, but there are roundabouts all in this corridor. Um, and then all of the minor intersections, we they are right in, right out, turn restricted, but it does allow left off of US2. Next slide. This is just another close up of Lawson Street to Hayden Road. Next slide. And next slide. And I think we are back to Greg. Okay. okay. No, thank you, Bonnie. Um, to support a development out there, there's been some ongoing projects. Um, City of, of Airway Heights has been working with the uh, development community to actually add some capacity at the Hayford Road and Highway 2 intersection. Right. It was um, There's the 6th, 10th, and 12th. Um, parallel network that Bonnie talked about north of Highway 2. Uh, that's uh, you know, a joint effort of City of Airway Heights, City of Spokane, Spokane County, and S3R3, the economic development arm out there, as well as DOT, to get um, a partial build grant for, to construct some of that to get a first phase in. Um, also with the, uh, the new uh, federal uh, funding package, the Spokane Tribe is asking for for funds to build a roundabout out by Spoko Fuel, which would also be the westerly terminus for the 6th, uh, 10th, and 12th roadway. And 18th and 21st would all connect in to that, um, that westerly connection. Um, there's also the Kalispell tribe is currently uh, doing, undertaking the study and looking at maybe improvements at Lyons Road, such as a roundabout. Study is still underway, so too early to tell there. And also, 
STA, you know, it recently completed the uh, uh, transit center, and they're also looking to develop a high-performance transit line out to the west lanes. Um, so a lot of things coming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just this is just a, a few of the, the many development projects. We have the Abbott Industrial Park uh, closer to I-90. We have the Aspen single-family home developments, Airway Heights, uh, or sorry, Airway that's Spokane County, um, Kalispell Tribe, uh, looking at uh, 200 and some acres for um, for development out there. The North 40, which is in the city of Spokane, and well, the, the North 40 is. Uh, almost complete. There's a lot of vacant land on that site for other other stores such as I know the Goodwill and Multicare have also have a building going up out there. Uh, so more to come there. The airport transload facility, certainly a lot more stuff can happen around that. Spokane so development again, many, many acres that could be developed. Hunter Crossing is a large housing project in Norway Heights. Another couple that are underway, Puget Puget Pipe. And McKinnis Street building south of Highway 2 in the city. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, back to Bonnie. Thank you, Greg. Okay, so this, this slide that you're seeing now is part of our planning level analysis along the corridor. Like I said, we are still working on the level of service currently. Um, but this will show you the travel time. So if you look at it, if you go westbound, which is the top line, you can see on the left there's AM peak hour U.S. travel time. So right now it's existing. It takes 10 minutes to go from Spotted Road to Mitchell Road. In the future, in 2040, it's telling me 14 minutes. So if you look at the flip side, eastbound, currently it's 9 minutes and 23 minutes in the future. And then same as PM, peak hour. So you've got 10 minutes westbound currently. In the future, it's, the model is saying 26 minutes. And then eastbound, excuse me, 10 minutes existing and 23 minutes um, future for the PMP tower. But that is without further strategy as well. So when we do the final analysis, there could be more strategies coming out of that. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this is the Practical Solutions Emerging Strategies for in and around US 2. It encompasses the more comprehensive strategies. So the emerging strategies from this study were developed collaboratively through the technical advisory team, like I said, and the Practical Solutions Lab with subject matter expert. So we also focused not only um, presented in past studies, the need for supporting networks. So Within this study, um, we identified we really need 6, 10, 12, and 18th and 21st. So 6, 10, 12, just a preliminary modeling shows that eight to 9,000 cars could switch over to take that route off of US 2, you know, for other um, just traveling um, pathways that they could take. So, and then 18th and 21st, it shows uh, and this is just rough, 12 to 14,000 cars that could take 18th to 21st. So it would, it has been shown that it would help uh, mobility along US 2 corridor. It also identifies the need to have connectivity into the urban areas, such as the downtown area, providing more provisions for bicycle and pedestrian activity, enhancing bus transit service, to meet the needs of the demographic area. So they are also, STA is also talking about high performance transit lines in the future. So that will also help. Next slide. So our next steps, and we're getting towards the end of this. I, hope, I don't know how much time I'm at. Um, we've only got our last slide, actually. Yeah, so, we've, got about, we've got about five more minutes. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, so can, we are continuously updating the Living Order Study web base, which is the connectwestplains.com, like I said. We are going out all of the committees, um, the boards, um, the technical teams, um, and we're also going out to the public open house. So we have a public open house online. It's ongoing from August 23rd to September 3rd. We're currently working on that now. 
And there is an invitation that I'm going to be sending out to all of you. We're hoping that you will share it wherever you can. Um, we also are going to have two public online live meetings. So one is going to be August 24th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. There will actually be an online presentation for the public for that night. And then we'll also have one August 26th from noon to 2.30 for those that cannot make it, you know, um, during the evening. So, and to the right, you'll see a QR code that'll take you right to our website. And like I said before, um, we are right in the process now of revamping that website, updating it, getting it up current before that public open house. Um, so this corridor has jobs that require people to travel beyond the nine to five job. Unless public transportation is provided, they will have no other recourse other than to drive there. So there is a need to provide active transportation facilities and to enhance public transportation and commute trip reduction services, CTR. So to close, providing for more residential development policies to support that and to have the land use support the residential development as well is a, is a need. So anyway, we just I want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, let us know. Does anybody right now want to ask yes. questions? Yes, member. Yes. Oh, um, Mr. Kinnear. Sorry. Thank you. you. There and you I'm, go. Okay. I'm not sure who. I know we're right at our time. Um, I'm not sure who to direct this to, whether it would be Greg or Bonnie. I heard no mention of providing for schools or what the water situation is, because with that much growth, we're going to need to plan for both. I would also commend you for talking about transit because I think by 2040, we better have a better, we better, better um, plan rather than people in their individual cars. So yeah. if someone could address the water issue and the school issue, that'd be great. Thank you. Char or Greg, do you want to address that? Well, I can maybe talk a little bit about, about the uh, water. So when, when Leland did, did their um, analysis, one of the things you know, they, they did is they did talk to the government, like the city, the county, and, and others on you know, what, would, what would be likely. So is, as long as it could be served by water or you know, water service is likely, because one of the things out there, there is some parcels that water service is quite remote to and, and you know and those were you know they don't show growth in those areas but areas that could likely be served they they did show um what exactly their conversations were with the uh, with the city we you know we were not privy to those conversations but i know that water was addressed but schools being a, a transportation study i don't believe um had a lot of um a lot of mention you know i could have been something that certainly was brought up to Leland. Maybe Shar would know more on that. So, so I would offer uh, Councilwoman Kinnear that um, I don't, do not believe that schools were actually a, uh, addressed um, in the look at an address of land use and transportation. I know it has uh, emerged in other conversations, but in regards to the uh, probability for land use development, it was not um, considered in Leland's. Study. And I, I would also offer, um, you know, Bonnie talked a little earlier about the level service analysis and uh, to give you a glimpse of um, really the, 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 the type of strategies that we're looking at, um, we are constraining um, Highway 2 for various reasons. One, we know that it's practical, but early on, a few years back, um, all the jurisdictions along the U.S. 2 corridor identified um, uh, a lack of desire to expand capacity uh, of Highway 2, one, uh, because it's prohibitive of pedestrian crossing, and we just didn't think it was the most prudent thing to do. So part of the challenge we have in this in this study is that you will see um, initially level service operations at intersections that typically are not at the level that we would normally um, desire uh, in that capacity type of world. But the way we will address the, that, that delta between what we like to see for mobility um, and what we predict will happen with the land use would be 
the way we manage the system with, with TISMO, travel demand management, which includes public transportation, enhanced public transportation, as Bonnie talked about, uh, CTR, communicating with drivers to let them know during peak hour the alternative um, opportunities that they have or will have to uh, access, access the places they'd like to access. So we're not going to expand this, this system to accommodate those few hours. We're going to manage, find ways to manage um, the system. And public transportation and after transportation are going to be high um, uses of, of, of that system. So having uh, a separated trail system that's partially built, uh, complete uh, provisions for high end users of uh, active transportation along the US 2 quarter are also going to be strategies and connectivity into Spokane through um, the new Sunset Highway quarter for active transportation. Yes, and Shar, I just wanted to add, we also looked at safe routes to school, you know, like in the sidewalk sections, things like that, and looked at, you know, we are looking at a crossing at King Street that was brought up during the Park Solutions Lab. Yes, and Shar, I just wanted Okay, Bonnie, Charlene, and Greg, thank you so much for this presentation. I would ask just to remind you if you could send a copy of that to us. I think that would be good for um, all council members to have to take a look at. And if we have additional questions, who is the best contact out of the three Bonnie. of you to call? Bonnie Gal. Okay, Bonnie. And do we have a phone number for you? I will include it in the email. Who shall we send the presentation to? I think what would be the easiest? To Hannah Lee. Probably to Hannah Lee. To Hannah Lee. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to send it to Hannah Lee Allers, she can get it sent out to she all of us. Have a LA. Thank you. Okay. And that would be do you have her email address? Char, do you have it? I don't think I do. It would be H. The link Allers was sent to H. you. H. Allers, yeah. She sent oh, you the link. Okay. okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you very thank much. You so thank much, you so everybody. much for your time. Well, thank you for all your hard work and for joining us this morning. That was very, very informative, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Garrett. Council, 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 Council Member Stratton. Yes. Um, I think that before we... Uh, went live, we passed the minutes, so we need to repass those so that they're in the record. Oh, okay. So let's stop for one second. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes for July? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The July minutes are passed. Thank you, Councilmember Burke. Okay, Garrett, I'm going to hand it over to you, and you're going to talk about the open space um, master plan. Yes, and I apologize for the typo in the agenda. Um, I imagine some of you are disappointed we're not talking about parking. We're talking about our preserve and play, um, City of Spokane parks and open space, or natural lands of what we call a master plan. And this is super excited times for us, I think, as a city. Um, we have not done one of these uh, universal plans in, in 10 years, 2010, well, 11 years. So two, 2010 is the last time we did it. And we restructured the program. It, that was a very internal driven uh, project where we had just internal, internal stakeholders um, that came and provided comment. And then we, we had the plan and then we went out for comment with that plan. We reversed that. This time it's very uh, citizen driven. So um, I have Nick Hammond with us today. He'll share a presentation, some great numbers, I mean, great participation that we've got um, from a lot of our citizens. And we get their feedback first, and then we form a plan, and then we go back to the citizens again. So it's really driven from the users of what we're doing well. What are we missing? Like, why do you not go to your neighborhood park? Or what do you love most about your neighborhood park? What are those missing links? And we have a lot to learn from, um, you know, with, uh, our riverfront park master plan from the planning stages to design to construction to then implementation. I think that is a big piece of it too. We can build the greatest infrastructure in this world, but if we don't activate it, 
we don't have the mechanism to do that, then we, you know, we failed. And I think a great example, and I will make a plug, this was our first weekend, of course, with our concerts in the pavilion. Um, can't thank the staff enough. We completely knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, three to 4,000 people um, each night uh, under the lights. And um, it was amazing. Even some comments from citizens of saying, you know, we've gone to a ton of outdoor venues across the entire Northwest and this is our top one now um, here in the heart of downtown Spokane. So that's something to learn about. And, and you know, when we have these master plans of how do we react from some of our successes, but then also some form of our failures and how we can do better. And so i um, super excited to, to move forward and Nick will kind of provide of, um, you know, where we're at, where we're headed and some of those numbers and next steps. And um, please feel free to ask any questions along the way. All right, with that, Nick, take it away. Sure thing, Garrett. Um, I think you pretty much covered it. I don't know. I think we're we're done, right? Uh, let's give you a little briefing. Like to talk. <laughs> uh, we'll give you a little background on what this is, and Garrett covered it. It's really a visionary document for the Parks Department. This is a long-range planning tool for us, um, and moreover, this this round, this is a great opportunity for folks in our community to comment on parks in Spokane and how they could be improved or changed in the future. So it's definitely not an operations model for us, and it's not our CIP program. That is a separate process, um, and it's not a, dis a detailed design proposal for any one specific facility necessarily. So we, all, we always like to show the big bubble of you know, we're out here master planning, and it's quite a few layers between the master plan itself and actual projects. Um, this is that, that guiding document. So. Um, I think Garrett covered some of our objectives, really incorporating our, our momentum that we have and some of the work that was done at Riverfront to um, then transfer and, and focus on what's next and really be strategic with, with those park resources. So we are in phase two of a four-phase project. Um, first phase was really sort of inventory and analysis for us, understanding our system and updating our, our data. I'll show you some of that. Um, we do have a project advisory committee. A couple of members of the, the council here are members on that committee, and, and so you're familiar and probably seen some of these graphics before. Right now, we're in our public outreach process, uh, the initial community survey. Um, we're wrapping that up online today, um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that here shortly. Um, we are scheduling our first public open house workshop format here in, in September. So we're, we're just still gathering those initial thoughts, and then we, we haven't yet decided what to do with all that information, but we're working toward that. Um, we have 105 city park facilities. We run about 2,600 recreational programs per year. Um, when you look at our facility, we have a number of internal classifications, which I won't bore you with. Um, all said and done, again, 105 facilities. Uh, when we look at that, this graphic, I think, is kind of helpful to understand how that land is chopped up. About 40% of our lands are natural. So a large portion of the city park system is undeveloped natural land. Facilities like the High Drive Bluff, Hamlin Park, uh, Beacon Hill, etc. cetera. Um, and then when you, you look at a, another chunk of land there is, is golf courses. And then the remainder of our sort of developed parks that folks know um, are about a third of our system. So how does that rank nationally? Well, Cool number here, we have 16 and a half acres of land for parks uh, per 1,000 individuals, which is a significantly higher than the national average. When we look at what our developed land is, we have about 5.3 developed acres per 1,000 folks. That's just above the national standard of 5.25 acres per 1,000. So about right for the land that we've developed, about average for the nation, but significantly more uh, value through our natural land. Um, we have identified a number of comparable communities we're benchmarking against, and this is still being produced. Uh, just wanted to show you those communities now. Those are Tacoma, Boise, uh, Eugene, and Grand Rapids, Michigan are, are, are all comparatives to Spokane. So that's another way, besides just raw land, to an analyze excuse me, how our facilities are standing up compared to some others. Um, some interesting information for you. We've completed a detailed geographic analysis of our park service areas. This hasn't been done in this level of detail uh, that we're aware of. Um, and we've broken it down by district. And what we've done is, is calculated what, how many folks in our community can get to a park within a 10 minute walk. That's a big service level standard for us. 
Um, and 90% of our folks, about 89% of the city can get to a park within a 10 minute walk, which is exemplary. Uh, when we look, we do have discrepancies between our dis uh, districts. Uh, District two has about as much parkland per square mile um, as the other two districts combined. So in our focus group poll here, you see on the left, there is a sense from our community that district one is in the highest need of some additional park improvements and that district three would be um, just behind that in terms of need and that district two would be lower in need. These are some of the maps. We've run these analysis um, on a couple of different ways and I don't wanna go into tremendous amount of detail here, but anything in yellow or orange is someone that's within a five or 10 minute walk of a park um, and everything in blue. Each of these blue dots you see is a residence, an address point that does not have easy access to a park facility that's developed. And when we run this analysis, I wanna be clear, this is only developed parks that we have swing sets and playgrounds and sport courts, et cetera. And this is not natural land or golf courses or parkways that don't meet that need for most folks. Um, Recognizing, though, that we aren't the only provider for parkland in the city, when we include the school district and the county and some PUD-related parks, we see a significant better coverage. You see that yellow and orange is quite a bit more of your map. Um, we see that in Shiloh Hills neighborhood, for example, we have you know, probably a gap in coverage. Uh, North Indian Trail, um, some of Five Mile, uh, and then Lincoln Heights and kind of Southgate area, so the fringes of town. Uh, areas that were developed later on, but the core of our community um, is fairly well covered in terms of park facilities. It doesn't tell you how uh, the condition of those facilities, but it does show you the coverage. Um, so there are documents available. We can go into more detail on those if needed. Um, in addition to that, we've completed a, a really thorough analysis and classification of our, in, our inventory of our facilities. This is on our website now. This is publicly available. It tells you all that you could ever want to know about parks. You know, where are they? How many are there? Down to the neighborhood level, um, the district and neighborhood level. Um, so skipping the public input, our structure of our plan has really been as outward facing as we can afford to do. We started with focus groups, um, had focus groups on each of the topics on your screen here, various aspects of parks and recreation planning. Some of the key takeaways from those, uh, this is just one question and uh, we asked was, you know, where should we be focusing over the next five years? There was definitely a sense from our focus groups that we should atten uh, give attention to maintenance and enhancement of existing parks then focus on developing land we already own, then focus on acquisition. And when we look at priorities there, that's something we hear. Um, after our focus groups, we've really been fo uh, focusing on surveys. Um, this is to get a general slice of the community and their, their sense of where we should be spending our recreation and, and park dollars. So this has been a primary vehicle for our initial public input. Uh, we weight these questions um, and we, we categorize them in a number of ways. Our, our project advisory committee has weighed in on this. You can see um, we've been able to spend some time out, out in the parks uh, talking with folks on these. So we've been working through ambassadors, through pop-up events, through targeted polling, signage. We've got a sign in every park, um, social media and print ad, of course. Some of the ads that went in your utility bills uh, are here. So far, we've received about 3,700 or 3,575 responses. We had a laudatory goal of, of trying to reach 5,000 survey responses. We've got about 3,500 and, and change. We've also touched about 1,000 folks um, in person. So we're very close to that 5,000 person goal. Um, and we're trying to get as many as possible. That's about 5% of, of Spokane households that we're targeting there. Um, in addition to the online survey and recognizing that not everybody has access to a computer, we've been just going to pop-up events, we call them. So setting up booths in parks next to splash pads, hitting all the city pools. We've been to three farmers markets, uh, Coeur d'Alene Brown's edition uh, neighborhood concert, a Spokane Indians game, and working through some of the traditional media uh, print boards with dots to get feedback from the public. So folks that may not be inclined to give us surveys, and then we've given out a ton of stickers to kids in the process, which has been really fun. We haven't digested all their comments, but we've got some great feedback from kids on what we should be doing. Um, so some of the initial, uh, initial thoughts we've heard from those events have been, uh, as shown on your screen here, I mean, one of the questions we've asked, and this is also in the survey, but we don't have that digested quite yet, is what outcome can we deliver that would improve equity in our parks? I and mean, it's a big question for us. 
And uh, there's enough variation in when people mention equity that we need to have a good understanding of what they are meaning when they're speaking to us. And so we asked, you know, what of these five or six options is your version of equity in a park? And we've heard so far that feeling welcoming and safe is the highest priority of, of park equity. So delivering welcoming and safe facilities followed closely by um, parks that are accessible for all ages. You know, our aging populations, our mobility impaired. And we've also heard um, that that really means providing amenities that older folks in, in particular or, or young teenage girls can use, people that don't use parks now often, you know, not just the traditional playground. What are the amenities we can provide that might draw some other folks to parks? And then third place would be parks within walking distance. Um, we also ask folks to rate, and I'm kind of scrolling around here, so I apologize if this is a little hokey, um, how important projects are. And, and we again heard daily maintenance and management, number one. Um, renovating existing parks, number two, followed by a close sort of tie between building new parks on city land and expanding our rec programs. So we'll, we'll continue to flesh this out with some additional detail of those additional 3,700 responses here shortly. Um, all of this is something we hope to distill down, we aim to distill down into what we call agency priority actions. So rather than listen to me ramble for hours on end about park planning, we'd like to get this into an executive summary of a couple pages that have very specific strategic directions with specific policy updates, of course, but also opportunity sites, you know, for development or recommendations for whether we should be developing or providing free and low cost programs, for example. So making those sort of big high level decisions on where our, our directions should be next in the, the parks department and then being able to track against those over the next few years. Um, really, we'd like to translate that public desire rather than staff interest into this plan and be able to, to showcase that. So what's next for us? Um, we are, are going to be doing our analysis over the next couple of weeks of the community survey. We'll continue to do pop-up events. So as you, as council members or citizens have requests, events you're aware of that you'd like us to attend, we're very happy to show up with a board and uh, hand out some flyers. The online survey won't be open, but that doesn't mean we still can't interact and ask questions. Um, we'll have our first community workshop September. We're looking the week of the 14th. We haven't set that date quite yet, but we'll be out shortly um, to let you know where we're headed there. And our next project advisory committee will be fall as well. So uh, that's where we are in the process. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? Hey, Nick, I want to let you know that you finished that. You have one minute, nine seconds left to the positive. Good job. Does anybody have questions? Councilmember Stratton? Yes. Yes. With the online surveys, could you tell me where the greatest response or the percentages of what district those have come out of? We will deliver that to you, Councilwoman. Um, I. If you give me a chance to share my screen real quick, I'll show you a simple graphic of, of our survey software, which tracks down to a um, little bit below the census tract. So yes, we will generate survey responses by the city. We also generate them by the district, and we will be able to tell you um, how many folks approximately are, are responding from each district. So as I zoom in here, you can see, um, as I click on any particular part of town, let's say we wanted to look at, um, somewhere over by Esmeralda Golf Course, I can see how many recipients have submitted from that particular area. And we, uh, we do that through the entire sort of patchwork of the city. So we will produce some information uh, for you there that is going to be able to give us a little bit more granular than just sort of everywhere in the city. And if we see that we have gaps that have emerged through this process, we'll make efforts to continue to reach out in person. So um, we have identified that there are particular groups in our community that aren't going to respond well to uh, a survey. Uh, Marshallese communities, one good example of, of a, a group that we have worked to connect with directly in person. So those don't necessarily show up in our online survey, but they are something that we're still gathering the same survey, just paper copies through their, um, through their networks, and then reporting on that through our, our outreach. I do have a question. Um, 
And Gary, I think you both would remember this. When we were working with um, West Central and the Centennial Trail Project, there were several community meetings where they had another location that they were looking at a trail, natural area, that kind of thing. What happens to, as you're meeting with community groups, what happens to those suggestions or those, what they think are priorities in what they'd like to see with natural lands or park lands? What happens to those? And at what point do you communicate back to the neighborhood to say, this was a good idea, we're gonna look into it, or this isn't a good idea and here's why? Sure. Yeah, the, um, to answer that in short, this is a high enough level document that we're asking questions like, what are the types of facilities we are uh, supposed to be spending money constructing, let's say, when it comes to capital improvements? And so is it trails? Is it sport courts? Is it pickleball? What are the, what are the parts and pieces of your community we should spend on? So a lot of our analysis is that weighting of you know, general types of facilities. But in addition to that, we have allowed for very specific proposal requests, um, you know, chairlift at Beacon Hill, for example, or um, you know, the bridge over the river at the Waterworks Bridge by the Sisters property in West Central on Summit Drive. So we are taking those, and those will all find their way into our report. We're actually um, working with our consultant to take all of those and categorize them and then get, see if we have trends that emerge for specific requests. Indoor pool is another one that comes up every now and then. And so we are working to make explicit reference to those individual references. But at the end of our project here, we're really looking at sort of trends. And so the specific evaluation of those processes will be after this plan is complete. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Garrett. And just that, yeah, thank you, Nick. And and we're going to keep the council too updated along the entire process because it is our goal, um, even with our, our PAC team that we have, that when we come to a place when this, when this plan is ready to be, uh, be adopted, it will be a joint adoption between park board, city council, and endorsement from the mayor's office. So um, we, we have all the, the stars aligned for that to happen, but we want everybody just to be a part of that process because at the end of the day, we think this is going to be a huge uh, stepping stone for us in the parks department and really going to that next level in in our minds than now looking at those reinvestments at a neighborhood level, which is pretty exciting for us. So thanks again for the time. We appreciate it. We appreciate both of you being here and all the work that went into that presentation and um, keep us updated. We're all very, very interested in our parks. Thanks. Will do. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to uh, Tanya and Amy. And I wanted to let everybody know, I received a, a note from Chris Becker. She is unable to do the building permit update. She will be sending out that update via email. So everybody will have that, but she's not going to give a presentation today. So I'm going to send it over to Tanya Wallace for the financial um, presentation. Uh, thank you, council members. Um, and it's going to be myself and Paul and Josie that are going to give you a presentation today. Um, I'm going to start off with the five-year projected outlook of the general fund. And this is actually a presentation that um, I gave to the cabinet and the mayor back on July 25th. So it was a special cabinet meeting that the mayor held um, so that Paul and I could present the five-year forecast and the 2022 trial budget for the general fund before we started to open up the system and all the line, line item work that the departments were going to be doing. Um, and this was done about a, a little more than a week after the economic summit that we hosted and you all participated in. So that's the premise for this five-year forecast. And so you're going to see the exact same presentation, and you should have received that package this morning that also, also showed a couple spreadsheets in great detail. I'm not going to share those detailed spreadsheets with you on the screen um, so that I don't have to toggle back and forth, but I would encourage all of you to check your email um, now and, and open up that package so that you have those details in front of you as I walk through and share the presentation. And of course, um, we're always open to follow-up questions at a future date when you've had some 
some soak time to really absorb some of the numbers. Let me start. This is where I always seem to pick the um, Okay, um, it thumbs up that you see this. All right, very good. And so this is again a special report for you, Council, but it is the same report that we shared with the mayor and the cabinet. Um, I'm going to give just a, a an overview of the historical review of the general fund, um, what has been financially going on with the fund, and then a forecast and just a quick view of some of the opportunities and strategic focus areas as we head into budget deliberation. So here is a table that just shows the revenues and the expenditures from 2012. Um, but again, council, you wanna see the details, I would encourage you to look at the historical review that I sent in your package. But what I want to highlight very quickly here was in 2013, there was a deficit, or I should say just a net operating deficit. 2016 was a net operating deficit. And then of course in 2020 should be no surprise about that net operating deficit. I'm gonna just cover a little bit about historically, what are some of the major differences and what's been going on in each of these years, just for context. So in 2013, when we had that first deficit that you saw in that time frame, um, a lot of it was really when the city formed an EMS fund, and so there was a significant transfer of revenue um, to that fund. Then in 2014, our um, realized investment gains in interest. Interest has actually been a very um, interesting uh, revenue item. It has gone from producing several millions of dollars of interest earnings to loss of several millions in earnings as the revenue, as the interest rates have slowly started to come down, um, where we might have seen four or five million in revenue, we might now be seeing only a million. And then in 2015, Increase in sales tax revenue. So this is really when growth and recovery started to happen in this area, not just for the city, but regionally. And everybody started to see an increase in sales tax revenue. And of course, interest and income as our cash balances started to grow as well. Then in 2016, increase in charges for service. This was primarily where we saw in law enforcement services. And this was also an increase in the transfer out to that um, fire EMS fund. Then in 2017, again, increases in sales tax and miscellaneous revenue, primarily in investment gains. So it's been a very economically strong period during this, this period. And then in 2017, this is very important when you see that strong 8.6 million excess of revenue. This was the first year where there was no guild contract. So we had strong revenue, but a somewhat false decrease in expenditures because had the contract been implemented at that year, there would have been more expense than what we're experiencing. So just keep that in mind. Um, in 2018, revenue decreased because of the change in income. Again, this is where we're really starting to see our, our investment income fluctuate and then an increase in the transfer out. Just a reminder, this was the second year of no guild contract. So now we've got a compounding of that expense savings. So what we would have projected to have happened didn't happen. And so it is adding to our accumulation of fund balance. Council President Beggs? Yeah. Um um, Tanya, <coughs> excuse my froggy throat, but we didn't reduce revenue. It was just the rate of revenue. Is that fair? I thought we had extra revenue in 2018 than we have projected. 
Um, Council President, there was additional revenue in some of the categories, but if you look on, I'll say if, on the detailed sheet in 2018, there was actually a total loss of revenue by 0.3%, and that was largely because of a loss in interest earnings. Okay, thanks. Mm hmm uh, moving on to 2019, this was also an exceptionally strong year, significant sales tax and, and uh, change in miscellaneous revenue. Um, in a lot of area around the region, this is where sales tax in some cases surpassed property tax value or property tax revenue as a percent of the total revenue portfolio. Again, on the expenditure side, this was the third year of no guilt contract so expenditures are somewhat depressed compared to where they would have been. And then in 2020, a very exceptional year all the way around. So in the general fund, you will see that that is where we booked all of the CARES revenue. Um, and that is what really resulted in a increase in revenue or the perception of an increase in revenue that it was almost 10 million in CARES funding that we had received. And then on the expenditure side, we settled the guild contract. So we had four years of guild contract and retro pay that hit us in 2020, in addition to a near $10 million of CARES funding that was expensed through 2020. Now, council members, we have, um, provided for you in your packet an alternative of what if we had taken the CARES revenue and expense out of the general fund, how would we have looked? Because it kind of distorts um, what would have happened. And you would have seen that the general fund would have actually had a 2.4% decrease in revenue. It would have gone from, a, from what you see 201, almost 202 million to only 197 million in revenue. And then on the expenditure side, while expenses would have been 203 million compared to 198 million, or expenses would have increased 2.2%. One of the things that, that I wanna emphasize, there was a lot going on in 2020 because of CARES. Not only did we have a significant um, retro pay and guild settlement, which was an anomaly in our expenses, um, but we were anticipating that our revenues were going to, we were going to lose revenue. And of course, we did to the tune of 2.4% on revenue losses. But the city took very proactive measures to contain our expenses so that we were not going to be using unappropriated fund balance to the extent that we needed to. And that was in part a lot of cost containment. Um, a lot of positions were held on, on hiring um, that did add administrative burden to continue to provide those services. Um, but the city did very, very well overall. Um, and we, we thank you, Council, for um, the work that you did in supporting those administrative options. And you can see at the end of 2020, we used a little more than six million in unappropriated fund balance. So now shifting to the forecast, um, and of course this is gonna be a very different kind of forecast. This is not um, a typical recession. And so the recovery is not gonna be typical either. We do have a forecast. It, detailed spreadsheet for you in your packet where we have also projected for 2020 and at the time in June when we made this projection um, we were, ant were anticipating uh, a net deficit of about 5.8 million compared to the planned deficit of 3.6 million. Some of that is we're going to still anticipate an increase in sales tax revenue coming in stronger. Again, that's pent-up demand, and we're closely monitoring that even now, Council, 
and we'll be in a position to give you a better projection in September um, because it is exceeding our expectations, even though we anticipated stronger um, rebound, it's coming in even better than that. So we're going to update it, update you in September, three months from, from the time that we did this projection. But one area on the revenue side that we are still concerned about is with our utility tax. Um, those accounts are still lagging. So we are projecting that the general fund is not going to be receiving quite as much utility tax because of that lag in utility payments. Um, than what we expected. Miscellaneous revenue also seems to be slightly down. I have a quick question on utility tax, yeah. if I may. Go ahead. Tanya, did you run these projections with the utility tax um, being included for um, the wastewater tax for those that are outside of the city that are using the other um, facility? Because that would be possibly helpful in making up this gap. Have you run the numbers with that? Um, Council Member Mamet, we have not run the numbers with that. We've run the numbers based on, on historical what we've been bringing in, um, but we can certainly do that scenario. I think that's important because that's a decision we'll probably be needing to talk to the mayor about soon. Thanks. Yep, I made a special note of that. Thank you. Um, on the expenditure side, um, Positions are being filled, so the hiring freeze, there is no hiring freeze in 2021. Um, so so we're, we're closely monitoring that. We are finding that in some cases it's a challenge to hire and fill for some positions just because of the labor market um, that, we're, that we're experiencing right now. You're going to hear more about that from Paul, and we're continuing to monitor on overtime. That is definitely going to be something that we're going to be monitoring, particularly for the fire department. So just a heads up on that. Now, as we look at 2022 through 2026, you will see in your packet, and I'm just going to jump right down to, to the bottom there. Um, and this is with, without, in this scenario that you see on this, is assumes most importantly, no employee compensation increases. So that is a huge difference here and stronger growth. If we do assume for employee compensation, then that will bring the, the deficit quite, up quite a bit to eight to nine million in the general fund. Councilmember Mum. Do you know if we factored in all the MFTEs that are coming off the rolls? Um, to contribute to, um, to the property tax revenue? Um, Council Member Mum, no, we have not factored into that level of detail. This is just a higher level. Um, a general growth on new construction, and that is our primary growth factor for property tax. So we do have a little bit of a different animal with that MFTE, and they started coming off this year. I think that might be something to check. Uh, you might be surprised. Um, we did get some information from um, the, the county at the end of July. So they were just not, some of that is not being factored into the June projection, but we are tightening that right down for budget purposes and did receive some information at the end of July. Thank you. Um, on here, this is um, this is where I really wanted to focus you. Again, there are a lot of um, information here, but we've taken out a lot of the the in this particular forecast. It's a lot of the differences in related to COVID, and so this really represents we still are experiencing a structural deficit, which that should not be a surprise. Um, a lot of jurisdictions, it's a constant rebalancing. Revenue only grows at a, a certain pace, and we need to contain our costs at the same pace. So that is that is what we're showing here. <laughs> One more time, <laughs> if I may. Yeah. Did you include the um, cliff uh, contribution, annual contribution to the fire pension that comes off in a few years?
No, but we will do that. And I apologize. That was just something I was unaware of. Yeah, it's a couple million, I think, or a million a year at least. I'll, I'll go offline with you and work with you on some of this. Thank you. Challenges and opportunities. Kurt has a question. Oh. Yeah, sorry, just wondering, on the, the sales tax side, does that include the $1,590 or are those segregated out just because they're more for a specific use? Um, excellent question. The $1,590 or the housing sales tax dollars go into a separate fund. So none okay. of them come through the general fund. Okay. Challenges and opportunities. So some of the challenges that we're going to be facing coming up, um, certainly the new libraries um, are going to be opening up in 2022, but we need to develop a strategy to fund those libraries and the additional cost of operating them. The estimate right now is, is around $900,000, um, and there are some equity, open hours of equity that we'd want to address as well. Of course, the labor agreements, we have a few labor agreements, uh, Local 29 and 270 are both open and they, so if those get negotiated, those could, if we stayed on track of a 2.9% historical increased confinement, that could be anywhere 6.2 million. Support services, and these are internal support services um, coming from a, re, in a recovery perspective, there is a lot of pressure to continue to support our operational departments, and a lot of deficits have been realized going through the pandemic of where we're lacking good support services. And then emergency dispatch. A lot of funding has been added to emergency dispatch but there's still a few issues to resolve, operational issues, and we anticipate to resolve those fully. We'll include another half a million dollars. And homelessness shelters. As you have seen, council members, there have been several SBOs coming through this year to address our homelessness crisis and not a sustainable funding source from the general fund. They have used unappropriated fund balance to carry those services on, but that is definitely a issue that we will need to contend with. Public safety equipment. Um, SIP borrowing, which is simply internal borrowing, our future revenue to cover costs today has been suspended. Um, and of course the transfer from the general fund into that equipment fund is insufficient to meet the capital needs of our police and fire departments. So we anticipate that to be about a five to six million at a minimum. And then expanded code enforcement. So code, code enforcement has been expanded temporarily in 2021 to address graffiti um, and other cleanup items to the tune of $750,000. But again, that used one time unappropriated fund balance to do that. And then the capital improvement plan. Um, at this point, I can only say many of millions. We're continuing to evaluate that, um, but there are a lot of city facilities and assets that have not been invested in over the last few years that will require some attention. But it's not without great opportunities, so we can't leave on a sad note. <laughs> um, a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. Um, charges for service. So this is a revenue opportunity, and it's really just reviewing a lot of our charges for service to make sure that we're keeping our charges current with the cost of actually providing the service. Um, there are some services, uh, charges, that have not been updated for decades. Um, so it would be a very good practice and certainly a recommended best practice to review those on an annual basis and update accordingly. Um, emergency dispatch service alternatives. Many of you are aware of that, so I'm not going to go into that, but there is a service alternative that could save 
um, at least 1.4 million as we understand today. Um, customer support and revenue collection. This is a time when a lot of jurisdictions understand that um, a positive revenue collection experience is what is going to be needed, particularly when city revenues are falling further and further behind in a struggling environment. Um, so this is also an opportunity. Better use of TIF and impact fees for economic development. So this is just, these are very strategic economic development tools. And the better we're able to apply these tools, we'll have long-term dividends into, into our coffers. And then use of the housing tax revenue to grow our tax base and address housing and homelessness crises. And I do think um, folks are definitely working on this. And this goes to uh, Council Member Cathcart's question about the sales tax revenue. It's not just 1590 of sales tax revenue, it's also the state housing sales tax revenue that we're collecting, $1406. And those are coming in about $460,000 per year. Um, and you might recall that's limited to only 20 years. So it started last year and continues to this year. Um, so that's a great opportunity to add for one-time costs as well. And then strategic use of other funding. Hey, Tonya, yeah. can I ask a quick question? So when, when we talk about homelessness and, and cost of sheltering and, and homeless services and resources, how do we figure in or are there discussions, since everyone is talking about this regional approach, that what kind of, um, of, of shared costs would there be between the city, the county, and the valley for those kinds of services as we go down that road of regional homelessness and the, the region kind of coming together to create that, those resources? Is there a discussion on how much would, would be kicked in from each, um, from the county and the city of Spokane Valley, or are we handling that cost on our own? Um, that is really, really a great question, um, council member, and I do not have an equally great response to that. It is um, at least my own opinion, just my own opinion, that is a multi-year kind of conversation. Um, I have observed the city of Spokane has really led that effort and therefore has also funded that effort. And it's just going to take probably several years of, of discussion and negotiation to engage partners in that regional discussion. Councilmember Kinnear? I, I just wanted to comment on that. We've been engaging them for multiple years. I wouldn't count on anything changing. The county does kick money in, but it's passed through money. So they're not taking money out of their general fund. The city of the valley, not taking money out of their general fund. We've been talking about this for years and nothing has changed. I, I'm not gonna count on that personally. And most jurisdictions do pass through dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a different kind of national conversation that is going, around, going along as homelessness um, is being, it, it, it's an elevated issue at this time, and certainly the pandemic is going to um, exaggerate the, the condition around the country. So I think different kinds of conversations, and you, we're going to see a lot of different things happening. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So basically, you're projecting out by 2026, so the next what, five years that we would have uh, uh, essentially over that time accumulated a deficit of about 20 million. I mean, if we could operate in a deficit, that would, that would essentially be what we'd be looking at. We would have a very significant deficit, yes. So if, if some of the opportunities and challenges that you just laid out don't, you know, make a large dent and there aren't some other significant changes that come about, are there any um, 
uh, recommendations for reductions anywhere that the administration plans to bring forward sometime before, you know, in, in the budgeting process for the next budget? Um, yes, there could be some recommendations that the administration brings forward. Um, we are just focusing right now for 2022 on how we get through the pandemic and the recovery. I would expect more strategic conversation. Some of the changes that the city may be required to make are things that cannot be made in just a couple months. They would be long-term adjustments. Um, and and I, a common analogy that is used is turning the ship. It doesn't turn on a dime. It takes a very long time to change um, some of our operations. But yes, the short answer is we will have to change. That's kind of the, the last item there is very strategically use our other funds that are available. Again, we have the local um, American Rescue Plan dollars. We have rental assistance dollars. There are several other federal grant opportunities on the horizon. So if we're very strategic and target those grants, as we're changing that ship, we, we should be okay, but it is gonna take a lot of conversation. It's also, the last point there, is we're gonna to have to do things a little differently. Um, good investment in good tools and education go a long way in doing things differently. Thank you, Council Thank Member. You, Go ahead, Council Member Wilkerson, and I'll go after you. Uh, thank you. I just want to circle back around one to the homeless shelter. We know most of that money is passed through, so this $1.5 million is what the city is looking at investing out of, its, uh, out of its funds. That's question one. And then two, with all those savings, I guess I'm just concerned how much the numbers and accounts have been scrubbed for resources that have just been sitting kind of on the sideline and has not be re been re-engaged in the budgeting process. Uh, great question, Council Member Wilkerson. Um, yes, in the budget process uh, this year, we are scrubbing all other funds and you will see a lot of suggestions to to look at those other funds, use them to the greatest extent possible. That one and a half million is really what's been used one time from the general fund. The general fund does not typically grow one and a half to a, to a couple million in new revenue every year. That is not offset primarily by personnel increases. And by personnel increases, I just mean contractual obligations. That does not account for it added staff also has to be funded from that. The, I, I mean, the, the, the best case is if we're gonna carve out a couple million in the general fund, then we will need to look at other services and modify them. There, there's just not enough revenue in the general fund to cover that without modifi significant modifications in our other services that are funded from the general fund. But we are looking at every every possibility, and you are going to see that coming through um, the budget. So Council President just asked in the chat the question that I, I was about to launch, which is, you know, really there's, I'm not seeing a labor strategy on the opportunity side, and I'm just wanting to add that to the list because last we heard we were down 184 positions in the city, which is getting close to 10% of our labor force. And I don't know if the savings, cost savings from that has been offset by overtime or if that's included in this year's budget. And how are you anticipating that for 2022? Are you anticipating all those positions being filled and that's part of the expense or you know where is that supposed to go? Because from what I'm hearing, we haven't had that low of a a labor shortage for three decades, and and you know this uh, that e that pushes your overtime up uh, often. 
Uh, and um, so sure. we've got to get to a sweet spot there. And I agree with you. It's sometimes like turning a aircraft carrier, but in forecasting, just going forward, I'd like to see that as part of the strategy along with where are we with our uniformed overtime? We have had some extreme circumstances, hard to predict that in the future, but I'd like to know, are we 10% over, 30% over budget, 50%, where are we there? We usually have a routine report, uh, but looking in the forecast, it would be nice to know what you're forecasting for overtime as well. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and Josie. So um, great comments. Thank you, council members. I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and Josie, who's gonna give you um, a much tighter, just focused on 2022 trial budget for the general fund. And then also council, you are gonna see more financial information for 2021 in the F&A committee, where we will talk a little bit about over time um, and what's happening specifically in 2021. And then just a reminder that for September, we will give it, be giving a more in-depth projection for 2021 as we're seeing both on the revenue side and to your point, council member, um, mom, over time and how, what's happening with the labor side of things. Thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. Paul, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good, uh, good morning, uh, City Council. I'm going to share uh, one quick document, which I, I sent to Hannah Lee a little bit earlier today. I'm not sure if it made its way out yet. But this uh, should be reminiscent of the, the DFG, the draft fiscal guidance that uh, the prior administration used when talking about sort of the upcoming budget year. And I'm just going to walk us through uh, relatively quickly how we get to what we're calling the 2022 trial budget, if that's okay. And I apologize uh, for the camera uh, not being on today. I'm uh, home with a house full of sick kids. So you might hear some activity in the background as well. Uh, so we started off with our 2021 adopted revenue budget of about $207 million. Uh, the way that our system is set up, we use the prior year adopted budget as a starting point for the upcoming year's uh, base budget. So we had the $207 million. Uh, first thing we did was take out some of the one-time revenue items. From that side, we had $2.7 million included in the 2021 budget for the CCC revenue settlement and approximately $325,000 for the Shrek lease revenue. So those one-time items, uh, we, we deleted those out, which gets us to our 2022 base of approximately $204 million. The next thing we did is uh, multiply that by the projected increase, which Tanya just went over on the revenue side for the general fund of 2.87%. And that gets us our 2022 estimated general fund revenue of approximately $210.5 million. Any questions so far on how we got to that point? Okay. So uh, we've moved on to the expenditure side, again, starting with the 2021 adopted expenditure budget of approximately $208 million. We made some uh, adjustments um, before we prepared files for city departments. So the first thing we did was we deleted temp seasonal and project employee dollar amounts from departments. And we did this for um, all city departments except for library, parks, city council, and civil service. And the reason we did this was to make uh, departments take another look um, at their true needs for those temp seasonal and project employee positions. Um, and we split those groups for obvious reasons. Parks, library really depend on them, uh, civil service and city council. We don't really have uh, control over your budgets, I don't know if that's come up in the past as well. Um, so we, we are asking departments to take another look, a closer look at their temp seasonal and project employee usage. I think that the last we looked, there was about $3 million citywide, and this is just the general fund portion that you're seeing uh, of temp seasonal positions out there. We're just asking people to take a, a closer look about their true needs. So we also then went through and deleted the reserve for payroll adjustment. That's the uh, where we recognize that there will be some salary savings from not having a, a fully uh, staffed uh, city workforce. So we're gonna recalculate that for 2022, but at this point we just took out the placeholder that we had in 2021. Similarly with um, budget reserve for budget adjustments, we just took those out for now. We took out some of the one-time items, which I'm sure will be a point of discussion as we go through this process. So we had the $150,000 increase for the youth bus pass program that uh, Spokane Transit ended up uh, covering for this year. In addition, in addition to the uh, the one-time increase for Human Rights uh, Commission funding. So we just went through any one-time items. They weren't targeted. It was just anything one-time. 
we, we took out for, for this exercise. We did then increase the parks general fund contribution. You can see the asterisk there um, in the city charter. Parks is entitled to 8% of the prior year actual general fund expenditures. So that calculation uh, increased the contribution to about $950,000. It increased it by $950,000. I don't have the, the full share uh, in front of me. I think it's around, I'm not sure if Gareth's still on, about 10 to 13 million, I want to say, is, is the general fund contribution to parks. Uh, and then we went through our risk allocations. We have our workers' comp, uh, unemployment, and just general risk uh, policies. And we uh, increased that based off of the, the broker's 80% uh, confidence level for those three, those three types of risk. That increases the general fund uh, share as well. And, and uh, it's also spread out to the other funds proportionately. Uh, contractual wage increase, incumbents updated. So we just uh, sync the system to what's happened in real life over, over the last eight months. So positions have been updated. Uh, this still includes um, any contractually mandated uh, wage increases for the next year, which I think for 2022 at this point only includes one union. I think it's just the uh, Prosecutors Association is the only one under contract. So it includes that. It still includes that increases uh, for all city employees. Um, and then the benefit increases go, go along with that as well. So that's all updated for 2022. But as Tanya mentioned, uh, no... Um, uh, Collective bargaining uh, uh, increases are assumed. There are uh, a couple of asterisks there as well. Uh, yes, Councilmember Rome. Hi. Did you include the fact that since we don't have almost 200 employees contributing to the SERS, did you take the 10% out on both sides, payroll side and um, administration side? I would definitely have to double check that one. Because that's a big hit. That's 20% of uh, 200 employees' incomes. Correct. Yeah, and I, I don't know if, if we capture that in, in this exercise, but I'll, I'll double check and we'll get back to you on that. Uh, so those, those puts and takes gets us to about $214 million on the general fund expenditures, which if you're keeping track, we're already, just from those exercises, about $3.7 million in the hole. And uh, from what I was looking through in past files, this is not uncommon for this type, um, this time of year and doing this exercise. Again, with those uh, fiscal guidance files I was looking through, this is usually what we're trying to solve throughout the summer. The other uh, problem with this, though, is we have a number of additional outstanding obligations, decisions, and adjustments that we need to account for in the general fund. As Tanya alluded to, the general fund contributions to fire dispatch, which uh, in the last couple of years, once the uh, revenue from outside sources went away, we've been covering with sales tax revenue. Uh, with the increases um, in, in staffing for 2022, I think this, this includes about 14 FTEs in the fire dispatch group. So it's going to be about $3.6 million additional in the uh, contributions to, to support that department. Uh, additional support to the library, the hot time you just mentioned this, about $950,000, which I think in speaking with Andrew earlier, uh, they might not need that full amount. Um, in 2022, as uh, new facilities come online and are operational, it, it, I think this was the max, uh, the high level. Of, of, you know. uh, civil service range allowance. Again, this is another thing that is in the city charter. City civil service is uh, allowed, I believe it's between 0.5 and 1% of classified employee expenditures from the prior year as well. So if they uh, elected to use their full 1% allotment, it would increase their contribution, their allowance by $634,000. Um, I don't know if you remember from the 2020 budget, uh, in order to help balancing, there was the removal of a $500,000 contribution from the general fund to asset management operations, facilities operations, to keep the city running. So this uh, assumes the, the restoration of that contribution to the internal service fund for facilities. Also includes updates for general fund contributions to street capital, which again, just matches um, the levy amount, so this is going to be just sort of baked in. And then uh, general fund contribution to the library, which uh, general fund also gives um, the property tax levy. They also get some funds from the general fund as well. And it, uh, 2021, again, to help with balancing and with needs, uh, we did not increase the general fund contribution to the library. So this represents, I want to say, a 3% uh, increase, and I have to double check if it's for 2021 and 2022, uh, contribution to the library. 
And then we have a couple of big uh, blank spaces here for public safety capital needs that Tanya also uh, alluded to, unfunded capital needs citywide, which we're working through with uh, CIP process, and then the, another big one, shelter system needs, another uh, blank space there. So all those combined, about $6.2 million, again, with those blank spaces, which gets us to our potential ending balance of almost $10 million uh, negative for 2022. So I know Tanya said she didn't want to be the, the bearer of bad news there, so I, I, I draw the short straw on this one. Uh, happy to take any questions on this, and uh, if you have any questions afterwards, please send them along as well. Anybody have questions? Okay, thank you, Paul. Oh, Candace, Mom. So I just want to go back to the revenue assumptions at the top. The I want to go back to the revenue assumptions at the top. Were you doing a factor of 2% off 21 revenues, 2.87? Is that right? Oh, council member, sorry about that. Yeah, my, my mic wasn't working and there's a baby screaming. 2.7%, uh, yeah, that's the historical average that uh, Tanya showed on the five year uh, outlook. Well, well, I just think that we might wanna have a factor of error in there considering we're coming out of a pandemic that just doesn't seem right to use a five-year smoothing on that. Um, oh, I'm, count, yeah. count. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Um, let, let me just interject real quickly. That 2.87 is just the outcome of individual revenue reviews. So we, in, we looked at property tax individually. Property tax is a certain formula associated with it. It's 1% um, increase plus a factor for the new construction role. So there is some estimation on the new construction role and that was a little more optimistic than historical factors because of what is actually happening with the permit information. Then we looked at sales tax individually. We looked at interest individually. We looked at each of the revenue categories individually and determined um, a projected revenue amount for them Separately, it's not it's not a collective 2.87. 2.87 is simply just the ending result of all of those individual revenue reviews. Okay, that makes me feel a little more comfortable. I thought you were just using it as a factor. So, um, you're using sales tax off of what? Sales tax. A lot of it is actually. Um, you can't really, you can use trend analysis if you'd like, but the sales tax was really a lot of that economic information from the, the summit that we had, where we did look at the individual categories. You know, for example, tourism, we're expecting some rebound in tourism, but we looked at retail, average retail, which was coming in much stronger than anticipated. So there we took it actually down to the sector level, but a lot of it is is still what are the economic experts projecting? And that was the basis for the sales tax. And we'll continue to do that on a monthly basis. And that's why September will bring forward a, a slightly revised projection based on what we're seeing actually happening in the sales tax arena. Right, with a, maybe a factor of error or something. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have questions? for Paul or Tanya. Tanya and Paul, is there anything else that you want to add to your presentation? Um, no, but thank you council members for, for, we wanted to bring this to you a little earlier in July and did not have the opportunity. So, you know, thank you for making today happen. It's been a little bit bumpy and we would have got this out to you. Um, but I greatly appreciate being added to the urban experience agenda um, in very short order so we could bring it to you. Thank you. Well, thank you both for joining us and for getting the information to us. Does council have any more questions or concerns before we adjourn the meeting? Okay, we are officially done for today. We will meet again on Monday, September 13th at 1.15. And um, I will see you probably in about an hour and 15 minutes for our next meeting today. Meeting adjourned. Thanks. Thanks for using WebEx. 
visit our website at www.